Good afternoon. And I'm going to say it one more time. Good afternoon. There we go. If I could have your attention, even in the back, please. We're about to start. Thank you. Happy New Year. My name is Cassandra Walker Pye. I am a president of Lucas Public Affairs, and I'm a member of the board of directors of the Public Policy Institute of California. And it is both an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to our first event of 2024. Thanks for showing up. Give yourselves a round of applause just for being here. I have a feeling you're not here for my good looks and probably because the assembly speaker is with us today and we're really, really excited that he's decided to join us. First elected to the assembly in 2018, Speaker Rivas has championed legislation to improve California's supply of affordable housing, increase workplace health and safety precautions, create the Golden State Teacher Grant Program, and secure the first in the nation COVID-19 farm worker relief package. In addition, he served as chair of the Assembly Agriculture Committee and vice chair of the Latino Legislative Caucus. He was sworn in as speaker of the California State Assembly in June of last year. Thank you, Speaker Rivas, for being with us today. Joining him is one of my favorite people, PPIC's president and CEO, Tani Cantil Sakayui, excuse me, Tani. As you all know, for 12 years prior to joining PPIC, Tani served as the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. This event is part of PPIC's 2024 speaker series on California's future. We would like to thank the sponsors of this event for their underwriting and their support. It makes it possible for these events to be free and available to the public. These organizations are listed on the screens and on the programs on your table. Let's please thank our donors and sponsors. This series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle, groups of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Please visit our website to find information on how you can join PPIC as a sponsor or as a donor. Before we begin, just a couple things to mention. As a public charity, PPIC does not take or support positions on any ballot measures or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. At the end of today's program, there will be time to respond to audience questions. For those of you here in Sacramento, just raise your hand and PPIC staff will come to you with a microphone. Please state your name and the name of your organization before asking your question. For those of you joining us virtually, please send an email to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Be sure to also include your name, your organization, along with your question. PPIC staff will be monitoring the questions that come in and incorporating them as much as possible. Lastly, and you know who you are, if you have not done so already, silence your cell phone. Thank you very much. And now on to the program. I'm really pleased to turn the program over to Tani Cantil Sakiyui, our president and CEO, who will moderate today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Good afternoon. It's a privilege to welcome the 71st Speaker of the California State Assembly, Speaker Robert Rivas. I'd also like to thank our sponsors and welcome all of you, but particularly the members of our board who are here today, Ms. Helen Torres, Mr. Steve Merksimer, prior president, and Ms. Donna Lucas, former member and prior president. And so we thank them for being here and helping us put on this series. Uh, the speaker's bio is long and impressive, and with our time together, I couldn't do it justice. But I would like to highlight some points before we start our conversation. 
So the Speaker Rivas is a lifelong resident of his district and lives in Hollister. And he has a legacy in farm workers' roots, having grown up in farm worker housing, raised by his mother and grandparents. His grandfather, a leader, stood with Cesar Chavez in the 1960s with the UFW to fight for fair pay, equal rights, and fair contracts. The speaker excelled in public schools in California, having received his bachelor's degree from CSU Sacramento and his master's degree from CSU San Jose. He began his public service to California working as a field representative for two assembly members. He was also an EMT, saving lives, and a firefighter, saving homes and families. He later served on the County Board of Supervisors at San Benito and was twice elected there as a, as a County Board of Supervisor before he was first elected to the Assembly in 2018. PPIC is truly honored to have the speaker here with us today. So Mr. Speaker, I've mentioned a little bit about your personal life, but can you tell us about your personal history and how it shapes your approach to policy making? Absolutely. Well, first I have to um, start by saying thank you. Uh, thank you to you. Always great to see you. Uh, I want to thank the PPIC board for the invitation. You know, as we were, uh, uh, we're up here on stage, uh, I mentioned it's unfortunate what's happening at the LA Times because all these layoffs, you know, um, uh, uh, it, having a strong, uh, you know, press corps uh, is critical to our democracy, and that elevates the importance of, of an organization like PPIC. But the info you put out, the reports you put out, are uh, very important to the work we do uh, here in Sacramento, and, and, and really should be a source of information for all Californians. So thank you uh, to the board, thank and, and uh, appreciate you. the invitation to be here. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Well, your personal history is so rich and fascinating, and so we're wondering how it is that um, it has affected your view of policy, politics, priorities, and leadership. Right. Well, you know, I, as I've said many times, I'm an unlikely um, a speaker, and I'm an unlikely elected official. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was driven to public service because of uh, where I come from, because of, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, my my desire to, to, to lift up uh, the community where I came from, to support others, to solve problems. Um, uh, I, I've, I've suffered from a lifelong stutter, so I've always had a fear of public speaking, and here I am. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and it's a large part of what I do uh, now. Uh, but, but really, when I reflect back on my approach to public service, um, the, you know, the approach I've taken throughout uh, my career, um, you know, it all starts, you know, the, you know my leadership style is, is, is really a reflection of where I come from. Um, you know, the fact that I grew up poor, and the fact that I came from a marginalized community. It was a community where I can, you know, remember, uh, you know, and I, and I should say I, I really appreciate um, two reporters. Uh, I had a long time to prepare for this job, you know, in, in our period of transition. Uh, and I spent some time with Jeremy White. Um, and Laurel Rosenthal, who made the time to come to Hollister, my hometown. Uh, both came to uh, Picenus, an unincorporated small community where I was raised. Um, and uh, uh, it was with Laurel, now the farm labor camp where, where I lived and where I was raised is now, you know, all those homes were torn down and it's now a gated, you know, uh, it, it has a cyclone fence, it's private property, but we made our way because the gates were open onto the property where I, I was raised. Um, uh, you know, but I appreciate them coming because that is the place where, uh, you know, uh, I started to d d develop, you know, the, 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 the leadership style I have today. Um, and it, you know, I lived in a community where it was very difficult for anyone in our community to get things done on their own. You know, we were so dependent on each other. Um, uh, it, you know, and that's how we got ahead, is, 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 is we leaned on one another. Uh, and so for me, when I was first elected to the Board of Supervisors in 2010, uh, I, I learned very quickly that I didn't bring with me, uh, you know, like uh, other, my other colleagues at that time that served on the board, I didn't bring with me a middle, 
uh, class experience. You know, I didn't bring with me a circle of influence that helped elevate me to the Board of Supervisors. I knocked on every door 10 times until people were shooing me away. Uh, it took a lot of hard work, a really grassroots level. But I learned really quickly that, that, that in order to be effective, I had to, you know, just do what I did best, and that's build relationships uh, with anybody. I could work well with anybody. It, it was about building coalitions around good ideas and then seeing those ideas across the finish line. Uh, and so, you know, that's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a large, that's, that's, that's my currency. It's always been about engagement. It's always engaging, always being present, always learning. I don't have most answers, but I'm willing to do the hard work to find those answers and to find solutions and to bring people together um, and, and to engage. You know, that, is, you know, again, that's my currency. Uh, that's how I became speaker. Uh, and uh, that's my leadership style. You know, thank you. To hear that tells me so much about you being the right leader at the right time. Because it's clear based on how you talk, even about setting a goal like to overcome stuttering and working in the community with others to get to a goal and doing the hard work yourself really sets California and you in this position in the right direction for things that we need to do together for as diverse as California is. And so you mentioned in your answer that you've had some time because the transition was over a period of time to now. So I was going to ask you, based on that transition in the first few months, or not even, not, not even that, but in those months, tell us a little bit about some of the important things you learned as speaker. <laughs> Um, well, you know, the job is everything I expected it would be, uh, and, and, and uh, much, much more. Uh, and I think, as I shared with you, um, you know, what I've learned is, you know, the importance of finding balance, you know, and, it, you know, it, it, you know in not only this role of speaker, but in public service in general, it's very easy to be consumed um, while in service, because, the, you know, the job is 24-7. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, you, you know, what you put in is what you get out of this job. Uh, you know, and I, you know, my mentality when I was at the Board of Supervisors, uh, I didn't have any staff, so I had to do uh, all my work. And thankfully, I worked for two previous assembly members, and so I knew, you know, what it took to, to, to work with constituents and to engage with, 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 with all stakeholders and work with, with you know, county staff. Um, and when I got to the assembly, uh, you know, I represent a very large district geographically, parts of four counties, um, you know, parts of the coast, parts of inland. Uh, uh, of the Central Coast, parts of the Silicon Valley, the southern part of Silicon Valley. So very different communities with different interests um, and different priorities. And so that required that, that we were constantly on the road, constantly engaging uh, across our district. And now as speaker, um, uh, I've been you know, very intentional in traveling the state and understanding, building relationships, trying to understand the issues impacting different regions across our state. Uh, and so finding that balance between work uh, and home life uh, has been challenging, uh, and you know I, uh, you know I take the responsibilities I have in public service very seriously. You know when I took my oath of office, uh, and I'm certainly you know and and as I assumed this role, I, I knew the demands of the job, but I also knew the expectations. Uh, I also knew the expectations from my colleagues in the caucus I get to lead of of this historically large uh, 62 members or 61 other members. Uh, and, and so I'm going to do everything I can to support uh, their work and, and the work we have to do together to solve so many issues and problems uh, across California, uh, but would not be possible without my family. Uh, you know, they <laughs> sacrifice so much. Uh, you know, I'm thankful for, for um, you know, uh, our technology and I could FaceTime uh, my daughter and FaceTime my wife, but the work, uh, you know, I, uh, I do uh, and the flexibility that uh, my family allows me to have, although they may not enjoy it at times, uh, would not be possible without them. Uh, and, you know, and that's the hardest part about this job, uh, whether it was in speaker or just being in the legislature, so much time uh, away from family. You know, I, I've missed my daughter growing up. Um, you know, I, I, when I ran first, when I made the decision to run for the assembly, she was, you know, two years old. Uh, and now she'll be eight in, in March. Um, my wife and I are also in the process of adopting. We've been foster parents in the past, and, and so we're in the process of adopting a seven-month-old baby boy. Who uh, you you know you can never plan um, when when you'll get a placement, uh, and so uh, we've been in this, this system to adopt, a foster to adopt, and and um, the week of our swear-in ceremony, mm -hmm. uh, we got the call mm -hmm. that uh, it was uh, you know the opportunity to start an adoption with a newborn baby, uh, and so it's been a, a tremendous experience, uh, and uh, but you know finding that balance is really important, and um, it's a work in progress. So. 
Well, thank you for sharing. We uh, all here are warmed, our hearts are warmed by hearing that uh, you and your wife and your daughter are in an adoption stage of a foster child and how important that is, we know, and, and realizing that you are away, but you are building a better California for the future. And I'll only say that when I was always asked about life work balance, I would say, objection, facts not in evidence, <laughs> because there weren't, but balance is, is relative and personal. Yeah. And so if we can help you in any way find that to make sure you <laughs> have the longevity, we are happy to do that. Appreciate that. So you are from a rural part of the Central Coast as part of your district, and we understand that Senator Mike McGuire, who becomes Senate President Pro Tem next month, also represents a largely rural district in the northern parts of the state, which is different for leadership in the California legislature. So my question is, how do you think both of you being from rural areas could affect the legislature's work on agriculture, access to health care, and other issues of particular importance to rural counties? Sure. Oh, it's, a, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and um, I look forward. I'm counting down the days until Mike McGuire is sworn in. Um, uh, so uh, he's the new kid on the block and, and, and not myself. And, <laughs> and so much attention has been uh, paid to uh, my leadership style and how I'm going to lead a caucus, how I'm going to you know, uh, work with chairs. Uh, and so I look forward to all those same questions being asked to Mike as well. Um, if, if anyone needs his number, reporters out there, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, uh, but no, I, I've always had an incredible relationship with Mike McGuire. He and I have always worked well together, and more so over the last few months. I've had a tremendous relationship with Tony Atkins. You know, the brief time I've had to spend with her, she's been an incredible uh, a mentor. You know, she commented to me at the end of session um, this past year when she uh, came into the Speaker's office about 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m., and said that in all of her time in the legislature, it was the smoothest end of session she's ever experienced. And that was because of the collaborative nature of our relationship uh, and, 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 and the fact that we are in this uh, to support our respective caucuses. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, you know, I know that I'm going to have the same level of relationship um, with, with, with Mike. And we share a lot of similarities. You know, not only do we come from, from, from rural parts of this state, and I'll talk about you know, the rural nature of, of uh, uh, our district in a second, um, but uh, you know, having the opportunity to serve with Mike in leadership now is uh, special, uh, I know for me and for the both of us, because I met Mike in 2010 when we were at a California State Association, uh, California State Association of Counties um, training for new supervisors, CSAC. Graham um, is nodding. Uh, Mike and I were elected the same year in 2010, and we were actually were at the same table, um, and, uh, and so that's when I met Mike, and so I appreciate his uh, service in local government. Um, uh, you know, I, I know we share a lot of the same priorities and experiences, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, working with him moving forward. Um, but you know, when you talk about the rural nature of our districts, you know, I represent a, a unique district. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, parts of four counties. There's a lot of intersection between um, you know, rural and um, you know, urban issues in the district I represent. You know, I represent the southern part of Santa Clara County, uh, which is uh, an incredibly important, one of the most important economic uh, and metropolitan hubs uh, anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, certainly a lot of the residents that live in, in my home county of San Benito work in the Silicon Valley, you know, and, and so we understand the issues facing rural communities, uh, is in, certainly in San Benito, I wanna say, um, my staff printed out uh, some, uh, some data points between 20, uh, 2020 and 2022. San Diego County was the fastest growing county in all of California. Uh, and so certainly we're a county that, you know, unfortunately our commute times have increased significantly. Uh, it, you know, from my door to San Jose, the Silicon Valley should take about 40 minutes. And now uh, for uh, a county where nearly 80% of the community has to leave the county for, mm. you know, uh, work, uh, they're spending two or three hours, uh, you know, in their car uh, and at times each way. And so for us, there's always been, you know, whether it be the Salinas Valley, San Benito, um, uh, Watsonville and Santa Cruz County, even the, the Southern Valley of Santa Clara, Gilroy and Morgan Hill, um, there are communities that have always felt left behind. 
uh, under-resourced, you know, not prioritized. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get the chance to talk about the community of Pajaro, which I represent, that is still yes. struggling to recover from a, 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 you know, a decades-long underinvestment in um, their waterway infrastructure there um, that was flooded last year. Um, and, uh, you know, so certainly I mention that because, uh, you know, we understand, uh, you know, the issues, the, 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 the long standing issues impacting, um, you know, our rural county. Uh, but I mentioned, you know, uh, the issues in, 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 in urban areas and rural areas, the priorities uh, are all the same. Housing, addressing homelessness, public safety, uh, climate change. Uh, there, you know, affordability, tackling affordability, you know, those issues uh, are all consistent, uh, uh, you know, across the state. And, you know, if anything, I've prioritized no region over the other, and, and that's why I have, you know, certainly worked incredibly hard to travel the state to engage, to see how we can make a difference. Uh, because our goal is we have to be relentless as a legislature uh, to make much more progress in, you know, addressing critical issues related to affordability uh, and improving the day-to-day -day quality of life of uh, all residents across California. I really appreciate that answer because I think when you, you led by really talking about a relationship and a collaboration, which has been your history, and to have the Senate on board just to d discuss and to be able to be collaborative about the issues facing California, which as you point out, are diverse, and that rural counties and both urban counties have left been behind in some issues. So this is really good to hear. We know there are many, many challenges that are unique to rural counties, and California has a substantial number of those counties. My, my next question uh, pertains to higher education. And so as a preamble to the question, uh, higher education, especially a four-year degree, as you well know, is one of the keys to economic opportunity and upward mobility. But the college-going rate among students in rural areas is lower than in other parts of the state. So we know this, so my question is, what can the state do to broaden uh, geographic opportunities in access to higher education and help more students obtain a four-year degree? Right, and you know, that's a, um, it's a, you know, a very important question, uh, and I really point to the work that, that, that has been done and that continues to be done. Uh, and uh, a lot of that work is unrecognized by the UC Merced's, uh, by uh, CSU Fresno, by the CSU and B's in, 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 in um, you know, uh, our neck of the woods. Uh, you know, there's so much um, uh, investment currently about creating partnerships between the university system, mm -hmm. partnering with you know, our local community colleges to you know, uh, you know, certainly have programs and curriculum that um, uh, uh, impact the local economy. You know, I'd look at uh, the, the, the example I know there at Hartnell uh, with a lot of private investment from the agricultural industry partnering with the community college there, Hartnell College, to have, uh, you know, pathways within agriculture where, um, you know, uh, students can uh, learn a specific trade and then uh, have, find that direct employment. Mm -hmm. You see a partnership now with CSUMB where they are developing an agricultural program. Um, part in partnership with uh, CSU Fresno, we have UC Santa Cruz that um, is uh, launching a program on uh, what I learned was this, this was it the blue economy uh, around you know the um, the Monterey Bay there, mm -hmm. and those opportunities. Um, but you know, certainly doing all we can to uh, expose students to those possibilities is incredibly important, and that's why there's such effort. There's always year over year efforts to invest um, in, in you know bonding efforts around education to ensure that that we're keeping up to date with our school infrastructure. I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, I appreciate you reading the bio. Uh, I also was a um, adjunct professor when I was a. a a uh, county supervisor at a local junior college at Gavlin College, but I also worked at a uh, very large high school, high school I graduated from, it's called Hollister High School, formerly San Benito High School, and it was at that high school where I was essentially a dean of discipline, a student support manager, um, and at that high school, it was two community bonds that have revolutionized that school. It's a school of about 3,500 students, but I point to the success in, 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 in what the school offers in the way of curriculum and opportunities for students at that school as far as uh, you know a, a state-of-the-art CET facility career maybe I said that wrong CTE facility no. career technical education mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they offer robotics and engineering um, and they offer all these pathways at a you know from from ninth to twelfth grade exposing students to those opportunities that exist beyond high school uh, in higher ed uh, and you go up the road to the Salinas 
the valley, um, which is the largest part of our district, and you have teachers sharing classrooms, and students aren't exposed to those opportunities, and 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 and, and that's an issue. That's a problem, uh, and that's why if you know if we're going to remain uh, the best you know state in the country, uh, if we're going to you know have a you know ensure that we continue our economic success, we have got to train the workforce of tomorrow, and that starts uh, here at home, uh, and and having those investments is incredibly important. You just made PPIC very happy because we have an emphasis on PK-12, one of our policy focuses, and we have a higher education center. And what you've talked about are things we're looking into with pathways and partnerships and transfers and CTE. And so we'll be on your doorstep with the- no, I invite brain. anyone to come to, to Hollister High School. The school doesn't know it yet, but I'll let them know you're coming. And they'll come. We they're, will, They're we great will. friends and partners, it's, yeah. Thank you. Okay, now this is a budget question, and so my preamble here is the state budget season is, is gearing up with Governor Newsom having released his proposed budget spending plan earlier, and legislative budget hearings start, I think, this week. The governor proposes to address the state's sizable budget deficit by drawing on reserves and using a combination of spending reductions, delays, um, deferrals, fund shifts, and other strategies. So my question is, how do you expect the legislature will approach handling the deficit, and, and do you have any thoughts yet on the governor's proposal? Yeah, you know, um, you know, I know, uh, you know, I can speak to uh, how we're going to uh, approach this budget, and, you know, uh, as I transition into the role of speaker, you know, I, as I mentioned, I, I knew the demands of the position, I knew the expectations, I knew that we had to uh, do things very differently. Um, you know, as I learned from, from, I've met with just about every former living speaker, have been so kind with their, 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 uh, their time, generous with their time uh, in offering me advice, sharing with me their experiences and how they handled certain situations. But my, my takeaway from all those conversations is every speakership is different. Uh, how they, the speaker structures their office, you know, what they prioritize, how they manage their caucus, it's always different. It's a reflection of the caucus and, and, and what every speaker has shared with me, or at least made a comment and noted is, is they never had to lead a caucus of 62 members. Uh, and so for me, engagement is, as I mentioned, uh, you know, that's my currency. It's incredibly important to me. And so how we approach this budget is we do so as a caucus. We've already had uh, uh, some, del some, uh, some deliberations. We had a very successful and productive uh, policy retreat where one day was dedicated to uh, budget and, and to our discussions. I have all the confidence in the world in Jesse Gabriel, our, our new budget chair. I appreciate all the work that Phil Ting um, uh, has done in, in his historic time as chair of the budget. Uh, but this is certainly the highest priority for us as we enter this new year. Uh, this is a year that uh, many legislators, myself included, I can recall my time being elected to the Board of Supervisors during the Great Recession. Um, but these are gonna be some difficult times and, 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 and certainly it's the highest priority when you look at this state budget deficit. It, it's gonna underpin everything we get done this year. It's gonna impact everything we do. Um, not to mention the highest priorities uh, for our legislature, uh, the issues that people care about, that I have heard firsthand about addressing housing and homelessness, mm -hmm. uh, about addressing public safety issues, um, you know, about addressing climate change, mm -hmm. you know, but most importantly, about addressing affordability uh, across California. You know, too many people are struggling to make ends meet. Too many people um, are uh, struggling to get by. Uh, and they're looking to the legislature uh, to make a difference. Uh, and so certainly when it comes to the budget, you know, what you can expect from us is a lot of um, some deliberation. Um, because for me, learning from, you know, former speakers, you know, it's put things into perspective for me is what, you know, what I can anticipate as far as opportunities and challenges that I know I will encounter as speaker. But it's also helped uh, uh, me to, to, to set expectations for myself, the type of leader I need to be, you know, the, t the type of speaker that I'm going to be, one that's going to promote transparency, one that's going to promote predictability, uh, and one that's going to um, foster a, a, a results-driven policymaking process. Uh, you know, those are the expectations I want to set for my speakership, and that all that will translate in how uh, we deliberate over the budget and how we negotiate and uh, we'll work with the governor. I can say it based on your bio, you have, that is your history, that is your track record. And I know you mentioned, several times you mentioned engagement, which is key to trying to understand a problem and to fix it. And when PPIC went to visit you in your office, there were so many people coming and going to see you and coming out satisfied and energized. So I, for one, am a believer in your engagement piece. Next is a question about retail theft. 
which is what you've referred to as a priority. And I know you've created a select assembly committee on retail theft to address shoplifting and the higher theft, commercial robbery, and other offenses. What do you hope might come from this effort? Well, you know, I could tell you why we started that select committee is, is you know, certainly, um, you know, always prioritizing, as I mentioned, relationship building, um, uh, you know, and prioritizing members of, of our caucus. And when members of our caucus approached me um, uh, to express their concerns, you know, I knew that we had to take a different approach than, than in the past, and we had to be pro as proactive as we can to try to get ahead of this issue. And so we established this, re this uh, select committee on, on retail theft really to, to, to uh, do fact-finding, to learn more about the mm -hmm. problems as they exist all across the state and in different regions. Uh, and so the goal of our committee was to listen, uh, was to uh, be fair throughout this process. I know that there's been one initial hearing, that there's, there's one upcoming in Southern California. Uh, and third, the goal is to uh, find solutions to this problem. I can tell already that you know a great deal about it because as you point out, it is regional and it's different in different mm -hmm. parts of California. So that you're having a hearing in Southern California is very important about that. And just related to that, do you see and do you have any priorities, any additional priorities in public safety, just generally speaking? Um, you know, uh, you know, I think for me, uh, the priority is to, um, you know, do everything we can as a legislature, you know, appreciate uh, all of the work uh, and the investment that has occurred uh, through our budget uh, by uh, this governor and by uh, his administration. I appreciate all the efforts by our attorney general. You know, uh, you know, he's certainly done, uh, you know, an incredible job, uh, you know, you know, ensuring that um, that we're addressing this problem. But, you know, for me, the highest priority is to ensure that uh, residents who live in this state, who work in this state, they need to feel safe in their communities. They need to feel safe uh, um, uh, as residents of California. And there is genuine concern uh, at the moment when it comes to public safety in general. Uh, and so certainly we have to be very cognizant of, and, and, and aware of that. Uh, and, you know, certainly that needs to be uh, front and center for us. Thank you. So you've alluded to this several times about poverty and the economy and home ownership. So my question is, at a time when home ownership is out of reach for many in our state, uh, lawmakers have taken many steps in recent years to increase housing production or even mm -hmm. housing affordability, down payments. What sort of impact do you expect from the policy changes thus far? And, and then besides the changes looking ahead, do you think there's more the state can do about affordability? I think there's a lot more that we can do. You know, it's, um, you know, actions always speak louder than words. You know, this is the highest priority, it has been the highest priority for us as a legislature and for this governor. Um, when I was sworn in, my first year in the legislature in 2018, um, I heard loud and clear from the governor that this was uh, a priority of his and, and for our state. Um, I didn't come to the legislature knowing I was going to focus on housing issues, uh, but I knew in my eight years in local service the, you know, the need for, uh, you know, to remain flexible. You know, certainly there were things I cared about, things I wanted to focus on, but what rose to the top very quickly was housing uh, because the discussions as they were occurring in Sacramento at that time, under David Chu's leadership as the chair of the Housing Committee, who was an, an incredible friend and a great legislator, um, he approached me and said, hey, we're having all these discussions, um, uh, but we need a voice from rural California. We need a voice to speak to how we can make a difference in, in, in you know, these other areas of the state. Uh, and so for me, I didn't have many you know, uh, answers or solutions, but I had that experience, you know, having uh, lived myself, uh, you know, growing up as a, in, in my childhood, coming uh, from a housing insecure, you know, situation, I lived in overcrowded housing. I, I, I experienced firsthand how challenging it was to, to live in that environment, to try to focus in that uh, uh, environment, to try to do homework, to try to, you know, get good grades. Um, but I also saw how challenging it was um, for my mom, who was a single parent, and my grandparents. You know, I often talk about my grandfather because he was, you know, I, I, my brother and I, we didn't have a relationship with our biological father. My grandfather is the man who raised us. Uh, and so certainly, you know, understanding how hard he worked uh, to um, barely get by to support our entire family. Um, but, you know, when it comes to housing, what's so frustrated about housing is we have to make more progress. Uh, we, we, we have to build on the successful policies that we've enacted over time, but those policies, unfortunately, haven't been enough. 
We've got to do more. We all play a part in the solution of ensuring that housing uh, is not a luxury item in this state. Mm -hmm. uh, housing should be a human right. Uh, every person, every person deserves uh, a, a quality and dignified place to live. And uh, we have got, it is the number one source of our high, you know, where the, we know our economic success, we're gonna be on the, on, the, on, on the verge of becoming the fourth largest economy in the world, but we have the highest rate of poverty in America. And that's a lot of that is driven by these exorbitant housing costs and unaffordable rents. And we have to do better. We have to make more progress when it comes to housing. It's reducing red tape, addressing you know, uh, impact fees. Uh, it, you know, it's about you know, trying to, to remove blight in these downtown corridors. You know, we've got to think very differently of housing, but we all have to be part of the solution. You know, as I mentioned, I'm not one to say, hey, we need to build more housing and my community doesn't build housing. We've built housing <laughs> and we're suffering from those impacts. But, 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 but certainly, as a county, as a community, we're better for it. You know? and, and certainly advocating on, on you know, the, the lack of infrastructure over time, um, you know, that's, that's why as speaker, I'm not gonna reinvent myself. I'm gonna certainly stick to the basics, what I've always focused on. And if I can advocate uh, for parts of the state that have had historic rates of underinvestment, you know, we need to change that. And it involves us having a working partnership with our partners at the federal level, of engaging with our local stakeholders on how we can all work together to find solutions. But what I have to impress is what's difficult about this housing situation is you know, a bill that's introduced that could be helpful for San Francisco uh, you know, may not be good for Bakersfield, may not be good for Fresno or LA. That's what's so challenging about this. And so any way we can regionalize this, any way we can address impacts and do uh, that hard work, uh, it, 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 you know, it takes a lot of work, uh, but, but you know, certainly we're up to that task and, and we have to do much more. The two things come to mind to me about your answer, and that is truly because you do know the regional needs, having been a county board of supervisor. And also, it was touching to hear what you said about being a student living, a young person living in crowded conditions and how hard it is to focus. And, you know, school is hard enough, let alone when you have these other factors that are influencing right. your ability to, to take the time to have quiet, mm -hmm. to focus, to do well, right. as you point out. I do want the audience to know that that will be a Q&A where you'll have an opportunity as well to ask the speaker questions. And we will have PPAIC folks coming around with the microphone. to. Uh, and when you do ask the question, we ask you to state your name and the organization you're with, if you're with an organization, for, uh, for all of us to understand. So I appreciate that. And we'll be, we'll be doing that in about eight more minutes. I want to ask you about climate. You've talked about that, you've done work in this. California is internationally recognized as a leader in climate policy. Can you tell us about your priorities for addressing climate change and helping to ensure that the state can reach its ambitious uh, climate goals? Right, well, I appreciate the question because you know, we are, our state, California, is a global leader when it comes to climate. Uh, and we have to continue to be that global leader because many states across our country aren't doing enough. Um, uh, my priorities are, you know, they, they change every day when it comes to climate because they keep expanding. You know, when people, uh, I read in the LA Times uh, last night that, you know, uh, over 100 people were rescued from flooded streets in San Diego. Yes. You know, this climate problem uh, is impacting our entire state. I live in a district uh, as I mentioned, I represent the small community of Pajaro. You know, four or five decades ago, it was uh, written in a federal report of the vulnerability of the uh, flood control system there. Um, but they didn't value the community enough. Again, the LA Times did incredible reporting on the issue. They didn't value the community enough to actually make those investments to repair the levee system there. It is a community that has flooded, had five or six significant floods. It's a community I um, visited with the governor last year, and it uh, is a community that's still trying to recover. Um, incredibly vulnerable uh, population. Um, again, critical overcrowded housing. I can't emphasize that enough. You know, they had estimated that 3,000 people were displaced. When we met with local uh, OES officials, they had said it's probably close to 5,000 because of the overcrowded housing situation. Mm. Um, it really is a humanitarian crisis in, in, in the region we live in, um, this critical overcrowded housing problem. Um, uh, but, but certainly when it comes to climate, it is impacting 
not only the you know, communities across our state, but it's impacting our pocketbooks. Uh, it is becoming increasingly expensive. Uh, it's, it's, it's impacting our ability to secure insurance, home insurance. Yes. Uh, you know, the impacts that are occurring to many communities, whether it's wildfire impacts, whether it is drought, whether it is too much rain, uh, you know, so certainly, uh, you know, emphasizing our priorities as a state, that's across the board. You know, my emphasis has been on, you know, uh, what I know and what I've learned around, uh, you know, the, the, the time that myself and staff has invested, especially my time as chair of agriculture, around natural working lands. You know, we hear about uh, carbon sequestration. We hear about the opportunity, uh, you know, around, um, uh, uh, oh, what's that term? I'm forgetting that term about. Uh, the capture. Carbon capture. Carbon capture, sorry. You know, and carbon capture could very well play a role uh, mm -hmm. in our climate, um, you know, uh, in our, uh, you know, in, in solving climate change, but we're not there yet. No. We can't, you know, capture carbon at scale. Uh, it's still in the works. Mm -hmm. The only way we can capture carbon is naturally through soils. And how uh, we manage our lands is incredibly important. Uh, and, 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 and that's something that, that uh, myself and Henry Stern, uh, Senator Stern, yes. have worked on together. Uh, the way we manage our lands uh, that can result in higher rates of agricultural productivity. It brings back, we can help restore biodiversity to many parts of the state, uh, but it requires a higher level of engagement and investment um, from, from, from uh, our state and at the federal level. Uh, but, but for us, climate change um, uh, is impacting us in real time, uh, and, and it is the highest priority for us. I had a, a very uh, encouraging um, a coffee meeting with one of my Republican colleagues yesterday who had mentioned that climate change is at the top of her list uh, as far as priorities. And so that shows that this is not a partisan issue. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a California issue. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly uh, we need to do uh, a lot more to ensure that we continue to lead in this space. Well, we thank you for your work that you've done because we know that you have worked on accelerating improvements at the Pajaro levee and we know you've been paying close attention. Also, at PPIC, we have referred to the same climate situation as the, the uh, climate or weather whiplash. Yeah. And you've pointed out not only the economic, but the humanitarian toll on not addressing that kind of right. climate change and the weather whiplash. So I think this is probably my last question before we turn it over to um, audience uh, participation. And of course, this is more of a writ large question. So 2024 is a highly controversial election year at the state and federal levels. California primary is six weeks away. Um, could you address what's at stake for California for this election before we head to Q&A from the audience? Well, I, you know, our democracy is at stake because Donald Trump's on the ballot. Um, uh, you know, it's incredible that uh, there is a, a high possibility that um, we reach November and it's a Biden-Trump uh, um, election. Uh, Donald Trump uh, was a disaster, and he's the greatest threat to our state and to uh, our democracy. Uh, and so um, to sum it up very quickly, I look forward to uh, going to as many battleground states as I can to do my part uh, to ensure that Joe Biden is reelected. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to turn to the audience now. They're nodding, but maybe there are some questions out there. And our PPIC folks, I know you can't see them, but they're running the mics. And they're going to wave at me. Sal, you have a person. Here you go. We'd like to know your name, sir, as well, and your organization. Uh, George Raya, retired. Um, a lot of attention is spent on the Senate race, but Governor Newsom is not going to be here forever. Who do you support, or do you have a favorite among the de declared candidates for governor? <laughs> well, yeah. George. I, you know, I have a lot of friends that have uh, uh, thrown their hat in the ring. I, I think I still have a few more friends that will uh, make the decision here um, in the months to come. Uh, it is only 2024, though, right? Uh, and so we still have some time. I look forward to working with Governor Newsom um, uh, moving forward. Uh, but you know, certainly, um, you know, look forward to the gubernatorial election of, of, of 2020. I think we're going to have a, a stellar field of candidates. Thank you. Anne. 
Good morning or afternoon now. Uh, Speaker Rivas, thank you so much for uh, your, your time and your story. I happen to hail, I'm in a personal privilege, uh, I happen to hail from a district you represent, Monterey, Seaside yeah. and Marina, California, and, and your story, so, so many parallels to a personal journey of mine as well as it relates to the safety net services that were so important uh, to, that improved uh, your, your well-being as well. Um, I, my name is Michael Younger. I am uh, the Vice President of Workforce Strategy for Calbright Community College, uh, the state's uh, first fully virtual community college that is accessible across the state. And when we talk about higher education, uh, some of the commentary is around uh, how bachelor's degrees and even associate's degrees can be that through line for BIPOC populations. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about those that are not trending towards that educational route, but how a skill, um, uh, a certification, uh, mm -hmm. some levels of workforce training can also uh, be a through line to their uh, overall achievement. Speaking uh, particularly about those that may have not seen themselves on the college track, but also have a value to society. Absolutely, I appreciate the question. I think we, you know, discussed it briefly, uh, you know, uh, in the conversation earlier. But there is, you know, so much opportunity out there, you know, as far as training opportunities, programs, career opportunities. But really, it's how we educate, you know, that, you know, that population. We talk about, you know, we didn't have a chance to talk about, you know. Um, AI and the future of AI in, in this state, but but you know certainly in agriculture, you know uh, I can tell you that you know there's always been uh, interest in automation. You know there's always been labor challenges recruiting. Uh, you know a, a, a labor force. It's, it's it's grueling work. You know it's you know it's work that you know uh, my grandfather did uh, as a lifelong farm worker, um, and, and I saw how uh, how how uh, you know that job you know, took a toll on his body and, and on his health. Uh, and so the need to, um, you know, have that transition can't come soon enough, but at the same time we have a responsibility to train those displaced workers. And there are opportunities in the state to get that done that meets their expectations, that meets their interest. But it's just certainly, uh, you know, about, you know, uh, you know, making sure that they understand what is available. Um, and we have any number of opportunities, whether it's through specific training programs, community college track, higher education at the you know, four-year uh, uh, institution. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, a lot of that work, you know, um, there are several opportunities to ensure that people get that information. That's incredibly important. Yes. We may have an online question. I don't, I think. Stephen, were you waving at me? Yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, we do have one that came in uh, from our online audience. And let me just grab my glass. Okay, um, this is from John Down, Senior Environmental Scientist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And he asks, uh, state scientists have been uh, out of contract uh, for about three years. Um, Entry-level scientists now make less than fast food workers at large chains. Uh, most state scientists are women. What does California's future look like if state scientists are not paid market rates can't live where they work and need to subsidize their income with a second job and trips to the food bank. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the question. You know, I think as uh, you know, I mentioned is we have to be very diligent in our work as a legislature uh, in addressing many, many challenges related to affordability, uh, ensuring that we're improving the day-to-day -day quality of life for all residents across the state. Uh, and you know, certainly the expectations for us uh, to make that meaningful difference are very real. Uh, and we know that we've got to make much more progress on many of these issues related to affordability, related to many of these challenges as the uh, question addressed. Uh, and you know, certainly, as I can't emphasize enough, we have to make more progress. You know, I, you know, we're all bound by term limits. Uh, we're very good when we get to the legislature of introducing bills to solve all of the state's problems. But we have a responsibility to look in the rearview mirror to ensure that bills we have passed in the past, policies that have you know, been implemented, that they still work. Uh, we have to ensure that, that government is working uh, for, uh, for our state. Uh, and you know, I can tell you, in traveling the state, uh, engaging uh, and building relationships with local stakeholders, understanding and listening to their frustrations, they expect a lot more from us. Uh, and you know, with the limited amount of time that I have left, uh, um, you know, uh, I want to get stuff done, uh, and it requires that um, that we understand those issues first uh, and uh, make that progress uh, wherever we possibly can. Thank you. We have to do better. 
Thank you. Yancy? Hi, I'm John Downs. Uh, you just answered my question, oh. but I'd like a follow up. Um, what does the future of California look like with underpaid state scientists who are here to um, you know, promote our climate action plans and, and do all the things that, uh, that we want done in the state to address you know, climate change and resiliency? Mm -hmm. Well, whether it's state scientists, whether it's low wage earners, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, our, our immigrant communities, our communities of color that, you know, have faced uh, many challenges. Um, you know, the community that, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned many times, I come from a family of farm workers. I lived, came from a marginalized community. Um, uh, you know, we have to certainly do uh, a lot more uh, to make uh, progress uh, on, on issues uh, that, that uh, will impact, you know, all people across our state. As I mentioned, addressing housing affordability, addressing housing, homelessness, uh, doing more in the way of improving the quality of life for all Californians. Uh, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, the California I want to live in. And that's incumbent on us uh, to, uh, you know, not only understand these problems, uh, but do that much more uh, to uh, make a difference uh, and to uh, enact policies uh, that uh, will improve uh, the conditions of, uh, of, of those that uh, are struggling to get by our, uh, here in our state. You know, at PPIC, we have, uh, in, in collaboration with Stanford, we have developed a California poverty measure that includes cost of California's health care as well as housing. And we have it with our safety net, which addresses uh, programs that serve and help vulnerable communities and, mm -hmm. and, vul and, and bridge communities. We have some more questions, and I'm going to ask Anne. Hi, I'm um, Blanca Begert with um, Politico's California Climate. So this is a question from the press. Um, and I'd like to ask, you know, on the climate front, um, are you going to make it a legislative priority this year to get a climate bond on the November ballot? And if so, how much money do you think that bond should be for, and what would be the um, climate spending priorities of the bond? Sure. We're in uh, active discussions about, you know, what, um, um, you know, the direction we're going to move in when it comes to bonds. And so I, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I don't know. You know, there have been a number of bonds that have been introduced uh, that we are considering. Uh, the amounts of them, we know that we um, uh, have, uh, you know, a ceiling as far as our bonding capacity. Uh, and so certainly with the current budget situation, we have to be, you know, very cognizant and aware of, of, of what uh, a bond, you know, how that's going to impact future years um, when it, as it relates to debt service, you know, payments. Uh, and, um, but stay tuned. You know, I've been engaging with Senator McGuire. Uh, but, but, but certainly those conversations uh, are occurring within our caucus to see what, um, you know, what are those bond issues, uh, if any, that we want to move forward with. Thank you. Sal? Thank you. Good afternoon. Just definitely want to take a moment to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for being here and joining us with one of California's most amazing jurists that we've ever had. Definitely want to thank you, Chief Justice. Um, thank you. My name, is, my name is Carmen Nicole Cox. I'm with ACLU California Action. And I want to appreciate you, Mr. Speaker, for embracing the value that housing is a human right. An affordable home should not be a luxury commodity available only to those who are well off. And we certainly shouldn't be displacing folks and um, leaving our family members and neighbors on our streets um, in mass shelters. But my question is about uh, public safety. Will you, Mr. Speaker, accept the community's invitation to take a public health approach to public safety rather than a criminalize, demoralize, and incarcerate approach for our families and neighbors? Yeah, I appreciate the question. And you know, as I mentioned, um, as we approach uh, many of the concerns related to public safety, whether it's the select committee on, on retail theft that uh, we created that is chaired by Assemblymember uh, Riggs Zabur, um, you know, uh, our approach in that committee and our approach uh, to addressing public safety uh, is, uh, you know, always, uh, you know, to first listen, to be fair throughout our process, and to find solutions. Uh, you know, um, uh, does that include uh, addressing public health? Absolutely. You know, but it, it, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's any issue, housing, any issue we consider, 
we always have to consider all options. And we, all, we always have to look and, 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 and work uh, with uh, all stakeholders. Uh, and, 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 and certainly understanding California's progressive values, uh, you know, and not compromising ever on those values and moving forward. But, I, but as I mentioned, uh, I, I use the term look in the rearview mirror. We have to be aware uh, of unintended, consequence, uh, unintended consequences from previous policies and how we can build on those policies to ensure that they're relevant today in 2024. Uh, and, and so for me, it's finding solutions moving forward, working and engaging with members of our caucus, again, 62 members, you know, proud to lead a caucus that is the most diverse uh, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly, but in that diversity, we also have uh, a diversity of political opinions and ideologies. Uh, and, and so uh, being aware of, of how we can have, you know, productive conversations as a caucus uh, to ensure that we are addressing the concerns uh, as they exist all throughout California. Thank you. We have about five more minutes, and we have a question online. Yes, thank you. And this is a question about insurance reform, and it comes from Aaron Stump, who's a broker uh, here in the Sacramento area. Um, and Aaron writes, uh, you'd mentioned insurance briefly when you talked about climate change. Uh, I have clients who are getting non-renewal notices and clients who are purchasing homes who have issues getting new insurance policies on homes that are not in fire or flood hazard areas. Uh, what, in the, what is the legislature's plan to work with the Insurance Commission to come up with a solution to the situation? Well, you know, certainly we're, you know, um, stand ready to support and work with our Insurance Commissioner, who has uh, worked very closely with the governor um, in, in uh, actions that have been taken in the past few months. You know, I know uh, as the first few weeks that I was Speaker uh, and this issue came up, I met myself and, and Pro Tem Atkins, uh, met with the governor. Uh, and briefly spoke about uh, this issue and, and, and how we would approach it. And very similar to the approach to retail theft, we, you know, uh, Chair of Insurance, Lisa Caldron, who, you know, um, uh, is, you know, you know, certainly working incredibly hard uh, to find solutions in this space. Um, you know, we have a, uh, uh, you know, she's leading the effort uh, and holding statewide hearings, uh, engaging with, 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 with all stakeholders on this issue. You know, uh, I can say that the concern that exists within our assembly caucus is, 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 is trying to understand um, uh, the impacts to uh, all consumers uh, of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in our state. Um, this non-renewal issue is a big, big problem, uh, but we are very aware of any decisions we make. What do those, what, what, what are those impacts? What are those potential unintended consequences? If rates are gonna go up, uh, we need uh, assurances that non-renewals, <laughs> you know, aren't gonna be an issue. Uh, and, and, and so trying to find that balance, uh, but uh, you know, we always uh, stand ready to, uh, in, to work with uh, our insurance commissioner and, and you know, obviously uh, our governor and, and uh, with the Senate. Thank you. Uh, Cassandra. Thank you. I think probably the last question, Cassandra Pai, Lucas Public Affairs and PPIC board member. You both use the word balance, both in the introduction as well as in your opening comments. And you also talked about the fact that um, you've got the largest caucus of Democrats of any speaker in history. But I also want to ask, just from a balanced perspective, how will you engage your Republican colleagues to be sure that those voices are also heard and a part of the process and decision making? Yeah, well, you know, I, is, you know, as I mentioned, I, um, you know, I have great relationships with um, members of uh, you know, the Assembly Republican Caucus and in the Senate as well. You know, as, as I mentioned, I was first elected to San Diego County Board of Supervisors, a five-member board where I served with four Republicans. Uh, you know, my wife was a Republican uh, and, until uh, Donald Trump was elected and, and uh, she no longer is a Republican. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and so for me, it's, it, look, it, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, and, and, you know, respect uh, the fact that many of our Republican colleagues, they represent, you know, unique districts as well. Uh, you know, and, and, and so certainly all the time, you know, is, is you know, I can't emphasize it enough. I, I, I knew the demands of this job, you know, uh, in preparing for it, and also knew the expectations and, and the time it would take uh, to ensure that members of our caucus and in the entire assembly, that they uh, feel supported, that they have the uh, resources um, uh, to ensure that uh, they can get the job done, uh, not only here in Sacramento, but uh, at home. I have a very close relationship with James Gallagher. He and I talk often and um, certainly look forward to working with him um, uh, as we move forward. 
Thank you. Well, your answers today have, have enlightened and inspired us. We look forward to your leadership. And we thank you again thank you. that we were included on all of your engagements for the speaker. Thank you. In conclusion, we're grateful you could all join us today, both in person and online. And for the ability to have that kind of engagement, we thank our sponsors who make this possible. PPIC is grateful for your interest. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.